There's a collective agitation, by the way, right now in response to this question. So that means that as you are tapped into her subconsciously, you're tapping into some vulnerable spaces in the crowd. So let's see what you have to ask. Hi, everyone. Hi, Teal. Um, my name is Seema, and... Um, I feel like I'm in an AA meeting right now. That was <laughs> <laughs> um, can you please tell me what is wrong with me? Because I, if I stand up here and tell you, we'd be here all day. I can't pinpoint one thing. I just, I don't know how to be happy. That's the happiness trip. You s it's exact. I was actually already working with somebody that had this particular issue. It's the fact that you expect that of yourself that's the problem. Why do you expect yourself to be happy? I don't know how to function. I feel like I should be producing something, but I can't stop crying. I can't stop feeling pain and suffering. And it got a lot worse after I met my twin because I'm separated right now and I, I'm completely just not able to function. Like, my sister came to visit me day before yesterday from Michigan, and I, I don't know how to be happy. Like, I'm so depressed and so sad and so... I feel like I have something to offer, but I can't because I'm so dysfunctional. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I keep trying new things, like different things to fix myself. Okay, so, so I'm gonna, ready for this? I don't know what's wrong with you. I've been trying everything I can do to fix you and it's not working. How'd that make you feel? Like, I know, I agree. Yeah, you agree, but I mean, like, how'd that really make you feel for me to say that to you? Um, I had less breath. Um. How about hopeless? Yeah. Feel a little bit like committing suicide? <laughs> Not while I'm here with you, but <laughs> almost every day. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm hearing is, despite the fact that that is the kind of thought I am feeding into my body every day, I expect myself to be happy. This is what they call the happiness trap. The minute you expect happiness from yourself, you start condemning yourself for being unhappy, it becomes a vicious cycle, and you are unable to get loose. Kind of like quicksand. You ever seen my video that I did called uh, If You Want to Find Happiness, Give Up on Happiness? I looked at it a few times, but that wasn't the call, the one that I felt called to watch, although I've watched a lot of yours many times. That's the video for you. <laughs> <coughs> you got to beware with resistance sometimes, because sometimes when you feel that resistance to doing or seeing something, it's because your ego is protecting your modus operandi for staying good. You've got the internal moderator. This is real important for a lot of you to listen to. The internal moderator takes over for adult figures in your childhood who disapprove of you so often, that it, and it's so painful, that it says, you know what, if I can discipline myself all day every day, I can get away with doing it before they do it. 
It's almost like it's, a, it's the same sort of attitude of I'm going to put myself down so nobody else can do it. And also it, it comes with this, this wonderful, and I'm trying to, I'm giving you a little bit of an insight into like why your ego is attached to this right now. What happens when you insult yourself in front of other people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you get love from them. So what happens if you're like, I'm dysfunctional and I'm unhappy and I suck and like, let me tell you all the things that are terrible about me. That's the only time that people actually come towards you. So, so the happiness trap often originates in a household where you only get presents when something's going horrifically wrong. So you're, you've got an attachment. The ego develops essentially an attachment to having things always be wrong with me. Otherwise, I don't get any presence. It's complete absence. Hospitals, by the way, when it comes to chronic illness, are full of, of people who have that particular conditioning. I have to feel bad. Because like it, what you're present to is that part of you wants to get better, but what you're not present to is that part of you doesn't want to get better. Is it because so then I don't have to commit to doing one thing? No. Then why am I doing that? Wha pretend, I pretend you're happy. This is actually me happy. <laughs> I'm happy here. <laughs> I want you to pretend you're really happy. I mean, everything's going awesome. Is there a way that we can get two microphones working? You know, like we arrange. I'm going to do something creative here. Albeit frightening as hell for me. Okay. Oh, all right. Does anybody else in the audience feel like they're suffering from this exact same thing? All right. I'm going to pick tattoos across the chest and glasses. This is going to be a session with the both of you come up. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you guys are both getting on stage. I need to break it to you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to explain why I'm doing it this way. You ready? I'm going to make you mirror each other. This way, you're going to get it. And maybe if you speak the same language as each other, which you pretty much should if you have the same issue, if one of you starts getting it, you can explain it to the other. Make sense? Okay, so since, since right now, since it was, basically we got to a point where you were really struggling to understand what was going on. So you're going to watch this. Okay, so you tell me about how this functions in your life. I'm not functional. I can't get happy no matter what I do. I'm just like, what the fuck? Um, I'm so what am I explaining? That how does that show up in your life? How does it show up? Okay. Um, yeah, I, w nitpicking myself and um, I guess thinking that the only attention that I can get is if <laughs> I cry baby too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess um, maybe that I feel I only deserve attention if it's bad attention. Mm -hmm. Well, I get that. So, um, so, so when you imagine getting happy, can you imagine? Hurts. So tell, tell us about that. Why does it hurt? So ima imagine, tell us what happy would look like to you. I'm not even sure. Um, allowing, no judging. Um, where would you live? 
In a cottage filled with vines. <laughs> okay. I don't know where. Thank you. Well, that's fine. We're, we're living in a cottage filled with vines. What other conditions look like happiness? Oh, okay. Um. A lot of people. Good food. What kind of food? Healthy food. Not crap food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. Talking. Sharing feelings. Those sort of things. Okay, so like imagine yourself happy in your body right now. Just see if you can feel that feeling. Yeah. Yes. I just pictured, you know what? Oh, <laughs> I just pictured doing it with my twin. Okay. That was. I just thought I would share that for possibly comic relief, but. And so and so, and that so. Didn't work out. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, what what I like is that you're being honest about it because the so you see again, this isn't society. We tell you you can't say things like that, even though we all think those things. Right. We have really weird thoughts. People have very weird thoughts. That wasn't that weird. <laughs> Actually. But you judged it as weird. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gotten that reaction. You see, that's law of attraction. That's how it works. I judged it as weird because he was abusive. So it's weird for me. I, I condemn myself, like you said, for wanting to go back to him. I don't understand that, and it terrifies me. Well, maybe you want to go back because um, it's comforting. It's almost the only space that you know. Yeah, so, so, so what she said is, yeah, he feels like home. That's the problem. So you ready for this? We're going to do this little exercise. It's a super fun exercise. I want you to think about what home felt like to you growing up. Literally, in your mind, just go there, relive it, and I want you to just think about kind of creating like a little Rolodex where there you've got these words written in your mind to describe what home felt like. So home felt like belonging, maybe for some of us. Home felt like being scared for some of us. I mean, just what did it what did it look like? What did it feel like? What does home mean to you? What did it mean when you were little? Now you're, you're so you're the one in the hot seat right now. So I want you. To, what does home look like to you? Um, dysfunctional. Hurt, suppress, um, emotional abandonment. Were you lonely? Yes. Yeah. Lonely. So chances are we could sit here for a long time and come up with a pretty big list, right? Sure. Yes. Ready for how we get into trouble? That's our first By interaction with that. love, is the home. Good. Which video? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll explain. I'm going to explain to you. Yay. I need it. Okay, so essentially, what happens when you get into a relationship, or when you're seeking a relationship, and you want that closeness? what you deem as love. That's what we're all looking for. I want love, right? Your brain is going to then search through its Rolodex as to what that means. But what I want you to do is to imagine, you know that list you just created. You can cross out the word home and put love. That is the definition of love that your mind has. This is why you attract the kind of partners you do, is because you don't feel love <coughs> from somebody unless they meet that criteria. That means unless I feel alone, it's not love. 
Unless I feel emotional abandonment, it's not love. That's why love feels so bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's, yeah, that's the lesson that you got growing up was love should feel bad. Yeah, it should be hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so then when it's hard and when it feels bad, you go, oh my God, I must be so in love. Makes sense. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, love has always felt very suffocating. So, so tell me, in your childhood, when you got happy, what happened? Um, almost that I took it away from somebody else. So you were a bad girl. <laughs> what happens when you're a bad girl? Um... Shamed, just shamed for feeling that way. So what did you have to do to keep the connection? Do you feel how when you're shamed or when someone withdraws from you, it's a disconnection? So in order to keep connection, what does that mean you have to do? Which is? Feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> did you get that? So we think people want us to feel bad? Yes. You don't think it. You've been completely programmed slash taught that. But if you get happy, you're taking it away from someone else. It's a problem for someone else. So you can't actually maintain connection and happiness at the same time. How do I fix this? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, first, you gotta, you got to see how that's true. Because you're, you're skipping the awareness step right now. So I want you to get really, really present to how that actually functioned in your childhood. Because she just got present to it. Okay. So in childhood, home felt like a lot of expectation to be perfect. And judgment. And trained to be a boy. Not like. It's not okay to be feminine. Um, but when you got happy, on the rare occasion that you got happy or excited as a kid about something, what happened? I don't know. I always just did what I was told to do. I don't know what that felt like. Did you see anyone else in your life act happy? Siblings or anything? Like when Michigan State scored a touchdown? <laughs> I don't... Both parents. It was just a very... Like, everyone's just supposed to do what they're supposed to do. and So you're only allowed to be excited if everyone's excited, because we're all around a football game. Yeah. What happens if one person's excited when the rest of the group isn't? They're isolated? Oh, yeah, because it's an invalidation. This is real classic... It's classic throughout all people, but especially in ethics. With real close, when you've got real close-knit people, the expectation is everyone's validating and mirroring each other. And if you're not, you're not one of us. So I always, like, run away from family. But then once I run away, I don't know what to do with my life. And then I just chilly because dally. Because you want connection. You need connection. I do. I really do. Oh, my God. Can we just get this out of the way and just say it right now? You need connection. Yeah. People need connection. Yeah. So if you're still listening to this, this spiritual shit, 
where basically you don't need anything but yourself, and if you are trying to need anything except yourself, it's a poor substitute for your connection to God. That smacks of people who grew up like you and who are using spiritual teachings to try to justify how isolated they feel. That's what that is. It's nothing but trauma. It's trauma teaching and perpetuating trauma. So, item number one, one of the basic human needs is connection. Now, when you get happy, you can't have it. That's how you were trained. Almost to try to connect with people, the feeling is almost overwhelming. Yeah, because it's dangerous, isn't it? That's the thing. This is, this is what happens if we grow up in a dysfunctional home dynamic. I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. If I don't, I'm disconnected and I starve to death. If I do, I get systematically corroded. Which is why I'm saying that what you need is to experience the opposite of that with people. It's like you can't rehabilitate. Do you understand like animals a little bit? Like dog training a little bit maybe? Yeah. They're the only beings I trust. Which I would expect. I considered myself, I honest to God you guys when I was growing up because I, I grew up in a dysfunctional home dynamic also and then the rest was a nightmare. Basically, the only thing I connected to was horses. It got to the point where I would go to school and literally in my head I was pretending I was a horse all day long. Like, it, all the time. I mean, it got to the point where there were, I was not even participating in my reality. I was in the fantasy of Teal as a horse. I'm a racehorse. I'm in fact being prepared. My teachers had a role, my parents had a role in that story of mine. Because that was where I found connection. So, yes. But here's the thing. So if you have a dog, let's say you've got a dog that's got a real big issue with rabbits. Can you rehabilitate the dog outside the presence of rabbits? Or do you need rabbits in order to rehabilitate the dog? Yeah, you need rabbits. We gotta, we gotta teach the dog to have a different behavior and a different association with rabbits. It, well, I'll let a dog trainer explain that to you. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of, but as it applies to you, what we have to do is give you a different experience with people. Yeah, this is helping. You gotta feel what it's like to connect with somebody where it's safe. No, you ready for step one? I'm going to give you, by the way, for those of you, any of you who are therapists in here, this is how we deal with, with this type of a dynamic. The people who are damned if I do, damned if I don't, relative to connecting with people, you've got to be present with them with the wall. So, both of you have a hell of a wall, yeah? Now, here's what I want you guys to both get. You can have your wall and have me too. Meaning I don't need, I don't need to crash it. It's okay if you're withdrawing from me and feeling nervous. I can be okay with the fact that you're doing that. It doesn't change what I'm doing. What I'm doing is staying present here. So I'm not going to violate your boundary and I'm also not going away. Woo! So what's the problem? There is none. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah! <laughs> Yeah. That, um, so say it again. The problem is? The problem is that we have a problem with having a wall. It's not okay to have a wall. I remember I was watching the LA um, synchronous, and, and the guy that you had picked to come up on the stage, he had the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the sound goes like I have no idea <laughs> what to tell you guys right now. Well, he had the same issue, and it was just basically um, that the people who have walls, we have an issue with having a wall, and the first thing we try to do is start breaking the wall down. Yeah. And then that makes us really scared, even of ourselves. Yeah, so you're still... Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, and you're... So <laughs> just, just so... I'm scared of myself, but I expect myself to be happy. That's like... That's like... Ex just so you know, that's like living in a house with Jack the Ripper and expecting yourself to feel safe. <laughs> You, you've got to stop expecting happiness. 
like literally give the hell up on that. You tell me. Well, it's a good exploration. For the journey. I, I would hope you would be asking yourself that question. Well, tell me what you've come up with so far. <laughs> okay, so that whole thing was, I don't know why I'm here if I should give up on being happy because I don't want to be here in pain and suffering with no happiness. And then she said I should be asking, oh, you heard that. So... <laughs> I don't, my answer is, I don't know. I ask myself, I've been asking myself that for a long time. Well, it feels like a long time, but daily. Do you think you came down to this planet to be happy all the time? Well, I think I came to help other people not suffer, but I can't figure it out myself, so I don't know. I don't know. Why am I here? These are the kind of questions I want you asking, genuinely. I want you to tell me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you're not okay with being in a state of questioning. See, like, and I, what I'm hoping is that you, and I'm hoping that the whole audience, sees the kind of resistance we have. Are you seeing the resistance? Like, we all relate to it, but I want us to also get really present to our resistance. Like, it's only okay to be here if, look at all the conditions you're laying out for yourself. I don't feel crappy. I am not scared of myself. I'm not, I mean, fill in the blank. We could go all day. Mm -hmm. but, but who's managed to do that? That's like saying I'm only okay swimming in the ocean as long as there is no jellyfish in the ocean. And no whales, and no sand, and no waves, and no, you see what I mean? At a certain point, it's like, just don't go to the ocean. Shit. You know? I do that. I know that's what you're doing with life. That's what I want you to get present to. You're doing that with life. Which is not the same perspective that your higher self had before you chose to come down here. Yeah, wh what was that? I'm going to go to the ocean with sharks, with sand, with waves, with too much sun, <laughs> you know. Why would we do that? Why do we go to the ocean even though there are all those things present? Ah, why do you go to the ocean even though there's jellyfish there in riptides and sharks? Because we need contrast. Do you not like the ocean? Oh, yeah, okay, what he said, just for fun. I mean, well, I actually do it to ground, specifically. <laughs> I was just talking to her. <laughs> so what'd you say? Well, um, it, like she said um, that she goes to the ocean to ground. And um, I guess I said, you know, it sounds like that you're still not even allowing yourself just to go to the ocean to have fun. You're only allowing yourself to go to the ocean because it serves you a purpose of grounding. And, and that's like still a chore within itself. So you're still not finding pleasure in grounding yourself in the ocean because you have to do that. That makes sense. Yeah, actually, that was what I was trained, was that you do something for a purpose, but... Ah, see why I like this? Yeah. She's like, gosh, that's so me. I have, but that's so all of us. Like, we have to, there has to be a bigger reason other than just that it feels good for us to be doing everything in our life. And then we're like, but I don't feel good. What's my problem? I need Prozac. You just have, I mean, like, it's sad. Trust me, half the time I'm crying about it, but up here on stage, from our higher self perspective, it's a little funny. Because it seems so ridiculous. You do see how ridiculous it seems? I have to do everything I'm doing for a purpose. Not just because it feels good, and why am I miserable? You've got too much crap in between you and happiness, that's why. 
this is on top of, I mean, like, what, what you've got to realize is this happiness issue of yours is a multi-layered issue. Number one, not okay to be happy and have people at the same time. That's a big one. That's developmental trauma, which we can solve through somatic therapy, by the way, which is what I would have you do, if anything. Did you get that before we move on? How do you spell that? S uh, S-O-M-A, somatic therapy. Okay. Yeah. Oh, God. I think I want to demonstrate. Is everybody okay with me doing a demonstration? Yes. Hmm. I am totally a willing guinea pig. Is this? Okay, hang on. Let me think how I'm going to accomplish this really fast. I really appreciate everyone's patience. Likewise. I guess I was going to say that that is one of my issues, is that um, I always feel like every time I, I speak or anything, it's um, unwanted. Well, it was. Not, not from you, from home base. I know. <laughs> okay, so before I launch into this, this whole thing, demonstration I'm going to do with you guys, first I, wanna, I want you guys to get that, like, it's real easy to get into this pattern of thinking that Teal Swan hates parents, right? Because I'm basically saying that that's what's messed up everything. But here, here's the thing, though is that when you came down to this life, you opted into contrast very fast because you knew that was what was going to cause your expansion. And your family base is that contrast. So when you sit in front of me and you're talking to me about the way you've ended up in adulthood, that's where we're looking. And it's gonna, I'm going to be real contrary to a lot of the more spiritual people who would love to bypass that whole thing and make it about a past life or other crap because why they want to maintain good relationships with their parents, I'm going to tell you. It's because of your childhood experience. And it's something that psychologists have figured out. Now, granted, psychology is at a very, you know, very baby phase of figuring out what to do with people. But they've at least figured that out about the way the universe works. Okay, so let's launch into this, shall we? Where did Blake go? Blakey, do you have to man that table, or can you come up here and be a guinea pig, too? He's like, I hate this. All right. All right, so I need one of those pillows. If somebody can toss one of them up. All right, I'm going to have, one of you is going to be like a little seedling. One of you is going to be kneeling on the pillow, and Blake, you're going to be, do you want to be standing or sitting today? You're the tallest. I really want you standing. Is that okay? Okay. Stand. No, you're standing right next to the pillow. Okay, which one of you is kneeling and which one of you is crouching like a little baby? One is kneeling on a pillow, sitting straight though. No, one of you is crouching like a little tiny baby sprout. How fitting! Yes, and one of you is standing. Okay, development, right? When we come down into this physical dimension, we intend to expand. In a third dimensional linear reality, expansion is seen through growth. We see that on a physical level when someone is physically growing. They start as a tiny baby, then they end up a toddler, now we've got an adult. But all aspects of our life essentially grow like that, including emotional and mental aspects of self. So your self-concept, that means the way you see yourself, goes through this same growth pattern. So when you're a tiny baby, you're a baby baby, right? When you're a tiny baby, 
when, sh when this little baby comes into the world, it cannot conceptualize of itself as separate from mommy or daddy. Mostly mommy. Then at a certain point, which is a tiny bit, and I'll just raise up just a tiny bit, just that much, yep. At that phase, the baby goes, oh, guess what? Mom is a separate being from me. Yet at this point in my development, I don't really want to meet my own needs yet. I want mommy to meet my needs. Now stay there. When you get to this age, because mommy said, oh, you have a need, I'm going to meet it, now suddenly that gives rise to the next expansion, which is, I want to meet that need myself. So you're the toddler who says, I want to tie my shoe myself. Make sense? So once you learn how to tie your shoe yourself, then you keep progressing and progressing, and here you are in adulthood. You're able to meet your own needs and all that other stuff, right? Now let's say that at some point during this phase, she experiences a trauma relative to whatever is growing. So let's say the self-concept is in the process of growing. If mom comes in at this phase and says, don't you dare do that. Did you feel what that felt like to the baby? She experiences a trauma. That's a trauma, right? And if she has no way of resolving that trauma, she cannot actually graduate to that. That's what resolution is. Resolution is, I'm going to take this thing that I just went through and weave it into who I am to become and actually help that to make me more. That's what resolution is. When we're a tiny baby, because we don't possess the capacity to intellectualize yet, we are experiencing the world through felt perception. We cannot resolve these issues. So trauma that is experienced at this age causes what we call developmental trauma. Means that she's stuck here. I mean, you might as well have whatever parent or adult figure caused that be standing on you like this. This is the rest of your life. Now what's going to happen is she's going to actually physically, because this is an emotional wound, the emotional self stays at this phase. The physical self is going to turn into this. And then the, the person who doesn't know what they're looking at is going to look at the adult and be like, what the hell is your problem? Like, take care of your needs. You're an adult. You can go get food. Would you ask the same thing of this baby? But this is what's going on inside the person. This is developmental trauma. So, how do we deal with this? We can't rationalize our way out of it. Why? Because the phase at which we were injured, we did not have the capacity to rationalize. So it doesn't matter how many psychotherapists this person goes to. Every time I tell them how to get themselves out of it, they're not going to be able to. Because the imprint of that trauma is stored somatically in the body. It means that your memory, when you're younger than a certain age, is stored in the tissues and in the cells of your body, not in your brain. So what we're seeing is, is that the best way to get ourselves out of the developmental trauma is through somatic experiencing. She never got to have a feeling of what it felt like for a parent to say, you know what, I can see that that's who you are right now. So when I do that for her in adult life, when she feels what that feels like to have somebody be present with her, guess what starts to happen? Yeah, stand all the way up. We fix this type of issue with developmental trauma through somatic therapy. We have to provide the missing experience at a feeling-based level for the person who is missing that experience. That is what therapy can do. It's why I am, like, really on board with that one type of modality. I'm usually super, super derogatory towards the therapy, but this is the therapy that I think provides the best in our space and time. Hmm. Yes. Okay, so what she was saying, what she said is, is that why when I go back to try to remember why I've ended up this way, I can't even remember it? Yes. It's because it happened during the phase of your childhood where you did not have the capacity to think about life yet. You were just feeling life. Aha. Uh -huh. You find a good somatic therapist. If I could do it for every one of you, like, I would do that. But you either find a really good somatic therapist or like what I've... <laughs> I released this video today. I don't know if any of you watched it. But basically, 
if you don't have enough money to visit a somatic therapist who is literally trained to provide the missing feeling experience for the body, then you have to think about what experience is it that I am missing and then seek that missing experience out. So for example, if I never had somebody sit down and really understand me, I need to seek out someone who can sit down and really understand me or ask that from my friends, for example. If I've never felt safe, I need to basically create some way for me to be able to resource the feeling of safety. You want me to give you a cool example? Okay, so um, I have one of my closest friends who's part of my intentional community, Graciela is her name. Some of you may have seen her on my videos. She was born at one pound. She was that premature. So she spent the first months of her life in a little glass incubator. And of course, this is before, I mean, a lot of hospitals haven't caught on, but this is definitely before when we realized that skin-to-skin -skin contact was how to rehab a premature child. So she spent forever isolated with tubes stuck in every single part of her body. Now, really, honestly, her adult life reflects exactly that. So what we could see is the missing experience was that she was not ready to come out of the womb yet. So the missing experience was the womb. She, she wasn't ready, you know, she wasn't at that phase where she was saying, okay, I'm ready to come into the world. So there's an aspect of her in developmental trauma that's like even at the fetus stage. So what does the fetus need? It needs the experience of being in utero. So what did we do? We actually built a simulated uterus in her room. Yeah. Yeah, so like, I mean, if you went to my house today, that's what you would see in her room. Like on top of her bed, it's a simulated womb. We've like put hot water bottles there. We've also got a little sound machine that you can get womb noises on. And she plays those noises and while she's completely covered up. And what, do, and what do we see? Yes. But that's the problem. Is that we're not allowing ourselves to have the somatic experience that's missing. And so we're never going to get there. Because we're expecting ourselves to skip a step. See, if I looked at her and I said, it, well, you know, too bad, you were born, so obviously that experience is not something that you deserve to have anymore. Expect yourself to be an adult. Could she? No. And which is exactly what we see reflected in most adults. Which is why we have to develop addictions and all this other crap, because we just to cope with life, because we don't have those experiences. Make sense? But it just so happens that when it comes to this type of trauma, which is, which is trauma related to parents not allowing you to have your own individual self. See, like, you're, you're not allowed to have happiness. When I'm unhappy, is I'm not, you're not allowed to have yourself. Do you get that? You're not allowed to be happy if I'm unhappy, is you don't get to have a separate self from me. So when you're looking at that kind of trauma, you're looking at interpersonal trauma. So the majority of what you need to experience and recreate are those missing experiences with people. So you need experiences where you feel a little bit of excitement and someone mirrors that to you. And when you start feeling the panic about the fact that you feel excited, somebody says, oh, yeah, I can definitely understand how that would be the case. Uh, see that? Look that smile. See? See, you know, you know tr traditional therapy for years would have said, well, don't meet a need. Don't go meet that somatic need because then the person's going to get dependent on it. But this, in fact is in direct opposition to the law of expansion. You come down here so as to progress. You don't have to force progression on anyone. They are going in the direction of it. It is the natural pull. In the same way that you don't have to force healing, when you cut your arm, it just begins to heal. Progression is going to be the natural thing that occurs through any human being. So if you meet a need, guess what happens? The person starts maturing. That means if you actually take care of someone's need for them, they are much closer to being able to meet that need themselves later on. Hello? Okay. So yeah, I don't know how to take care of myself. I am like a baby. Yeah, a lot of baby drama. So that's another situation. Um, I keep moving from place to place, not 
having a good home situation, living situation. Um, and that's a pattern that's been going on for several years, and I, I don't know how to get out of that one either. Um, I just feel like dysfunctional like I don't know how to take care of myself so do you see how if your developmental trauma occurred at a phase where you shouldn't have been taking care of yourself why you would be this way as an adult but it's like my I mean have you ever watched anybody in your family and how they deal with children babies just out of curiosity has anybody in your family had a baby that you watched be raised not really I mean I I wasn't watching as a, an adult. Well, watching as a kid is okay. Oh, well, my sister's younger than me. What's the reaction when she would cry? I have no memory. No memory at all. Mm. That's also a real good indication of trauma, by the way. Because like this is why you you get a lot of blank spaces. Besides the fact that you're recording things in your emotional body, the reason you get a lot of these blank spaces with trauma is because when the when the brain can't find resolution with something, it has no option except for to delegate the entire thing to the subconscious mind because it can't really work that into conscious life. This is why so many people who have been abused have like whole blackout periods of childhood. Is he my twin? Is he my twin? What do you mean by that? Is Fernando my twin? Like, actually? No, is he my twin flame? Fuck no. He's not? Hell no. Okay, so how do I stay away from him? I'm really serious. I'm terrified. Well, you're locked in a codependent trap with him. But he never filled any... anything. Oh, yeah, he did. Codependency is all based on needs you got to figure out what need he's fulfilling. That's your challenge, actually. I'm giving you that challenge over but the But I don't break. do anything right. I need you to tell me. No, you do. No. No, you do. Over the lunch break, your challenge is to figure out what need he is, in fact, meeting for he you. He feels like home. He feels like dad. Mm. No, that's a cop-out. He made me feel like having a period is okay? No. What do you get out of being locked into this dysfunctional relationship? I don't have to perform. I don't know. Okay, is he the real sweet one? Which one of you is... When you get into a fight, what's the dynamic? <laughs> He's not sweet. Um, what's the dynamic when you guys get in a fight? He kicks me out. Or he calls the police. Is it, but what does fighting look like? What do you mean? What does the actual fight look like? There's no fight. Like, it's just, it goes, okay. So, last time I saw him was December 28th in the morning. His phone rang. Uh, the alarm went off on his phone, and he yells, like, he barks at me to turn off my alarm, but it's actually his phone. So then I hand him his phone, and then he turns it off. And then I just said, I wish you wouldn't talk to me that way. And then he said, that's it. I've had enough. And he says, I don't want you here anymore. Get out. And then he takes all my stuff and takes it outside. And then he calls the police. Yeah. So how do I stay away from him? you got to figure out what you're getting out of it. That's the problem. Well, I don't... What am well, I... Th this is the biggest problem when we come to the, the codependent narcissist trap is the codependent becomes the good guy. Oh, well, so not. I want to feel good? Yeah, no, like... No. Oh. No. Well, I mean, that's a good... That might be it. Yeah, but, like, the codependent always becomes the good guy when, in fact, they're half the problem yeah. because they're getting a lot out of being with a narcissist. Like what? Like, okay, for example... They are incapable of leaving me fully because of their dysfunction. I'm the only person who they could ever be with, for example. I'm the only person who put up with them. Exactly. So if you've, got, if you've got real trauma around abandonment, then obviously that's the kind of relationship you need. 
But I don't feel like my parents abandoned me. I don't know where that comes from. That's the problem. From. The problem is is that when, from our adult perspective, when we're looking at abandonment trauma as a child, you're looking for an actual abandonment. Sometimes it's present, sometimes it's not. Sometimes all it takes for a child to be super traumatized to abandonment is mom and dad have to go on a date and so they sneak out of the house instead of telling me they're gone because they know I'm a clinger. I was sure he's my twin, he's but not she's your twin telling twin. me he's Ooh. not. So mm -hmm. that's like a whole different world now. Oh, twin flame. Yeah, we haven't been communicating since December 28th. Oh. Yeah, but, but I still feel... Well, that's the problem. You got out of the relationship, but not out of the pattern. The pattern for for, it, for codependence and narcissists is exactly the exact the exact same healing path, which is you got to get a, sen a sense of self. It's an unhealthy sense of self that leads to both patterns. That makes it, you got to get a sense of self. How? Well, you're starting to do it right now. But I've been doing this kind of stuff for years. And expecting yourself to be in a different place than you are. Yes. It's like, what, what this is like, on an emotional level, what this is like, is it's like somebody who has been in a high-speed car crash, and they've broken every been. bone in their body. I have. And now they're looking at me as the mm -hmm. doctor, saying, I've been doing these exercises, and I can't walk still. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. To expect yourself to walk still after breaking every bone in your body after three months is ridiculous. But I got... I know, but on an emotional level, that's what you're doing. How fa what, what criteria have you put on yourself? How fast should you be done with this process? So why should I be here for this lifetime of this process? There's got to be a meaning, a purpose to my life. Yeah. What is it? The experience of life. It's really painful. I know. Did you do much uh, spirituality one-on-one -on -one work or no? Um, is that a video? No. Pretty much every kind of spiritual practice that everyone teaches is one-on-one -on -one at this point in life. Did you... Try pose positive focus. I mean, I've listened to all of like the Wayne Dyer and all that stuff over and over. Did you try positive focus? What is, what is the exercise? I mean, did you really try it? Like sitting in a room right here, looking around the room for things that you uh, that actually make you feel good when you look at them. Sometimes I do that. I probably don't do it as much as I should. Honestly, talking to you on stage, I feel like the only difference maybe between where you are vibrationally and where you are vibrationally is that you're real ready for 2.0. And I feel like you really haven't got the fact that you can essentially control to some degree the way you feel based on what you focus on. Like it hasn't become enough of a sort of, let's call it religious practice, so that you get that you can do that and then progress to the next step, which is okay, I can do that, but I'm also using it to basically avoid stuff, so I'm using it as my point of resistance to something. You're there. You can feel that. You haven't gotten there yet, have you? So I came up with this practice, which is like trying to do that, um, which is basically, it's like japa um, repeating a vibration that is higher, um, and I decided I would do it in English because I would really know the meaning of English rather than Sanskrit and so you know like I use this mala and then I I haven't done it in a, in a minute though that's I think problem but when I was doing it well I was doing it but here I am like even worse but so I would I would write down okay I want to feel better and then I would either put a tally mark for every time I say I want to feel better 108 times or I would use the mala. I'm going to take you in a whole different direction than where we went to begin with them based off of sitting with you for a little bit. Okay. 
I, I literally, every time you th listen to me over the next X amount of time that you're watching me, talk about how positive focus doesn't work. I want you to tune me out because I'm presenting a college course and you're in kindergarten. Okay? Don't listen to what I'm saying because you need to do math a certain way. Make sense? Okay. I want you to basically start from square one. Okay. You're going to be doing what we call a, a spirituality 101 process. It's basically where you start to learn that you can actually alter the reality you're living in. That's critical. Okay. Does it, does it, I want some of you to think about whether this might be right for you too. It gets really confusing in the spiritual field when you hear, you know, like all these teachers who are saying positively focus and you can create your own reality and this is how to do it. And then you come to this type of a workshop with me. I tend to teach more the graduate program past that, which is... Yeah, you can do that, and you're also doing that to avoid something, so let's go towards what you're avoiding instead and do the work from that angle. But if you are in a space where you don't even realize that you have any say in what happens in your reality, and you don't understand that you can alter the way you feel based on what you're paying attention to because you haven't made it your religious practice yet, then we're going to take you so deep into the shadow that you're going to drown. That's what's going to happen. So then what you need to do is take it upon yourself to say, okay, you know what, Teal's teaching people, we're t we do you understand that vibration basically is like a sliding scale? Where someone is vibrationally is a sliding scale. At a certain point in people's progression, it's time for them to transition to what we call spirituality 2.0, my name for it. It's where we, we basically have come out of unconsciousness and said, ah, I'm a light. I can create my reality. I can focus positively. But then what do we do with that light? We take it back into the shadow and illuminate all the shadow. That's spirituality 2.0. That's the majority of what I teach as a teacher. But it is not to discredit 101. It's basically like in, in a math course, you may learn the basics about how math works, and then when you get to a college-level math class, they may say, guess what? You get to throw all that out the window now. Yeah, it's really frustrating. Yeah. You, how do you think it is as a teacher? It sucks. Because people are like, but wait, you said the exact opposite thing like 10 seconds ago. Yeah, because that person was in a completely different place. I guess that's what we all need to realize. That. We all are in different places, and we need to let ourselves be in different places. Oh, what we need to do is not resonate with everything that we feel or hear like I don't know we hear a spiritual teacher say something and then we like automatically assume that that has to be right for us because they're a spiritual teacher and they said it and so that that must apply to our lives but I guess we need to let it, it not apply to our lives you just need like to figure out which okay which yes. speaking <laughs> thing which thing we say essentially is the tool for you at this moment that's what you gotta figure out I, w I want you guys to start thinking about spiritual practice as if you were just arranging a beautiful tool shed just for yourself. This is my tool shed, and these are the tools that work for me. But like what you're expecting yourself to do, what a lot of us are expecting ourselves to do in spiritual practice is, okay, well that teacher says use a hammer on everything. Okay, so I'm going to use a hammer for every home project that I have. What happens if you need a wrench? I'm not allowed to use a wrench because my teacher says I have to use a hammer. That's nothing but attachment. That's attachment to one ideal. See? It's not letting yourself do what you feel is right because you're like, oh, well, I've already said this is right for me. How can this be right for me? Because this is supposed to be right for me. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you can feel it, by the way. When you're using a tool that is not working for you for whatever you're trying to use it for, you can start to feel this calling in another direction. Yeah. So it's I like, so you, you'll get to a point where essentially you, you do Spirituality 101 and you're like, oh my god, I can create my own reality, this is amazing. And you're so jazzed and everything's going so good. And then it's almost like you start to feel this pull. That's when the shadow self essentially says, look, now that you've awakened and you've got this consciousness, please bring it to me. You'll start to feel that pull. And that's when it'll start to not feel as good to do positive focus. Instead of it feeling like, yay, I create my own reality, you're kind of like, I feel almost like by doing that, I'm resisting something. That is your indication that you're being called into spirituality 2.0. Okay. Yes. 
but we can't even get there. You can't get there until you actually see that you create your own reality. You know, see it. So, <coughs> I feel like, I know you just made a video on this. I haven't watched this one yet. Um, <laughs> I'm going backwards. Like, um, because I feel like I got there, like I manifested my car, but then I went through that relationship over and over. Like, we broke up like 24 times in two years. And so every time I felt destroyed. Yep. And so I spent all my time putting myself back together and then I would sabotage and go back. And, but so, yeah, I, now I don't know what is going on. Like, I don't know how to do anything because I'm totally like... Nothing like a bad relationship to wreck a life. I get it. Yeah. So I, for in my own defense, I feel like I did get somewhere, but now I'm like in the negative zone. Have you gone, have you been focusing positively relative to relationships in general? No, I'm scared of people. These are there. Especially men. You haven't done it then. That's what I wanted to hear. Like I haven't really done it yet. I haven't really like poured myself into positive focus to a degree where I'm trying to attract relationships yet. I want you to see that you can do that before we start to, to go into the real anchors you've got about this pattern. Make sense? Okay. Like you're almost in a space that's too powerless to be going to this place that I want to take you. We could do it if we were isolated. Like if it was you and me in a center somewhere, maybe I'll create this one day. You and me in a center somewhere where I could isolate the Christ out of you and then like drive you into the shadow and go with you on that process every day. That's what I wanted to create, actually. Well, then maybe you will create that one day. Maybe. Someday. But what's dangerous is like we go, we sti stick our baby foot into it. You're not feeling empowered enough to go there right now. Right. You stick your foot into it and then I send you back out into the world with those patterns still. You're going to continue to get into the same relationship. What? Wait, I no, I just missed that last <laughs> sentence. I don't know, somewhere else. Okay, I think that one. We're just gonna like assume that that missed that one missed you because you weren't supposed to get it yet. So uh, rather than take you back into it, okay. I just want you. What I want you to take out of this is I need you to start positively focusing towards relationships. Meaning, what do I do? Let yourself have a girlfriend. Like a friend, that's a girl. And then you practice on spiritual stuff together. That's I know that's what I need. So just somebody to do the practice with me. Brevard. <laughs> Where do you live? Oh. Okay. Oh. And then, and then oh. when I you s sit there and think about positive aspects of relationships, start to write about what type of relationship you want to have with people. Like, if there is no limits. I'm a genie, and I, I land on stage, and I say, look, tell me exactly what you want in a relationship, and it shall be. What would that look like? I want that to be your focus. Okay? We've got to get you into a little bit of a more stable space before we go deep into these anchors you've got. Sound good? Okay, I think it's our lunch break, right, Blakey?